Okay, so uh, we have seen how we measure brand health, which is the first applied area within market research that we saw. Now we will talk about how to measure customer satisfaction, right? Let us start with why do we need to measure customer satisfaction? There are two or three main reasons for this. Satisfied customers are more loyal. They keep coming back to us for the repeat services, for more services, for wider services from our own stable, right? Satisfied customers are more loyal and therefore they're a long-term source of income. Uh, so, I mean, they come back to buy the same product. They also come back to buy other products and services from us because they have a good equation with us. They have a good, they're satisfied with what we gave them the first time. Importantly, they also recommend the brand to others and therefore they become marketing agents for us. So in the context of buying other products and services uh, from us, it's important to remember that uh, companies that offer a portfolio of services are the ones that benefit a lot from having satisfied customers because they can cross-sell. I don't know if you're familiar with the term, they can cross-sell. So they have customers of product A, they have customers of product B and they can sell product A to customers of product B and they can sell product B to customers of product C. But all this is possible only if the customers are satisfied with them. Otherwise they're going to say, listen, I bought this from you and I'm not happy. Why would I buy anything else from your types? Okay, why we need to measure customer set? This is a conceptual model for customer satisfaction. Um, I have to give credit to the right person who developed this model. This model is called service quality. Service quality, short form. It was developed by Dr. A. Parashuraman. Indian gentleman who was in the US when he did his research, pathbreaking research at that time in the area of service quality. So I'm just borrowing from that model here, right? Now, why do customers get unhappy? Because they have a certain expectation of service delivery or product delivery. They and they have a certain perception of what they're actually getting. Now, if there is a gap between these two, they get unhappy. If, if they think that what you're getting, or if they perceive that what you're getting is less than what they expected, or worse than what they expected, or different from what they expected, then they tend to be unhappy. Now, how do they form these expectations? The company itself makes some promises and some communications at the time of selling. We will do this, we will do that for you. We'll deliver within 48 hours, we'll deliver within 20 minutes. We will make sure that the product works smoothly 24 by 7, etc, etc, etc. Plus the industry has certain competitive benchmarks, you know, which people keep on observing. Saying, oh, generally this industry gives this. So we expect from one service provider, we expect what the industry as a whole gives as well. So these two things, you know, will shape what the customer expects. All right, now, why does this gap happen? It happens because of these other four gaps, actually. Number one, the company may not exactly understand what the customer expects. The company is supposed to, but it may not always exactly understand. The, customer, the company may sometimes say, uh, the customer wants the, uh, you know, the uh, products, you know, in a certain reasonable time of time. Uh, but you know they may end up assuming that the customer will be flexible. They may not know that he is flexible for this item, but he is not flexible for that item. So they may not, they may incorrectly understand the extent to which the customer is particular about a particular product being delivered in a certain period of time, or about a certain service being done, or about a certain repair being done, or about a certain feature. The, the company may say, yes, yes, we promised feature ABC, but customer will understand. C is not possible. Customer may not understand. The company might have understood this the wrong way. Secondly, the customer may not specify it, what needs to be delivered down the line in their systems. So, for example, the company may know that the customer expects service to be prompt. 
So they may tell the servicing team, make sure if there's a breakdown, service it promptly. But what is prompt? You have to give them very specific, you know, performance specifications. You have to say within 48 hours, within 28 hours, within 24 hours, within 12 hours, right? So there could be a gap between what the company understands and what it gives its performance specifications. There could be a gap between what the company specifies and what actually delivered by the people. The people may be lazy, the people may not have the right training, the people may not have the right infrastructure, there may not be enough manpower, right? So, now, all these gaps could get added. And finally, what happens is the customer is getting a low performance. Now, within this, the customer's perception is not 100% accurate. The customer is also a human being. Customer has, has emotions. If the customer is in a very good mood, he will be like, okay, it doesn't matter. These things happen once in a way. They're flexible. The customer is already in a bad mood. Is already impatient. They'll be like, you know, I'm having a bad day. Things are going on. On top of that, these guys are doing it so badly. So actually, the same incident, the same level of performance, based on the customer's emotional mood may be perceived in some situations as very bad or in some cases as acceptable. Therefore, the customer perception is not actual performance. So there's a gap between what the company understands, there's a gap between what the company understands and what it gives us performance specifications to its people. There's a gap between what the company gives us specifications and what people actually deliver. There's even a gap between what is actually delivered and what the customer understands. And the net result of these gaps is what the customer sees is, hey, I wanted this, but I'm getting this. I'm unhappy. Right? Does the model make sense to you logically? It's one of the most sound models internationally. It's followed by most organizations in some form or the other. In your experience, have you seen the, this is for dissatisfaction, this is when a customer doesn't get what he expects what he or she expects. But has it also happened that customer did not expect such a uh, good service and it has led to uh, extreme, uh, I mean, delight or happiness? I have seen that. I have experienced it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, some years ago, I was flying by Jet Airways mm -hmm. and uh, I walked into the airport I checked in my baggage, etc, etc. Then I went through the security check and suddenly I wanted coffee. Normally there is coffee available inside the security check area. So I looked around, there was no coffee available that day. The coffee shop was closed. And I really wanted coffee. So I went to the security guy and said, listen, I need to step back outside for a cup of coffee. So he said, once you are inside, you cannot step back outside. The rules don't permit it. So I was really frustrated. I mean, the rules are rules. I have to respect them. But I really wanted coffee. There was a jet airways, you know, ground staff, as I call them, airport personnel who was moving around. She asked me, what's the problem? I said, this is the problem. I wanted coffee. I'm not allowed to go outside, but I want coffee. She was kind enough. She walked out because she had access, obviously. She walked out. She got coffee for me and gave it. Now, I thought that was going well beyond the call of duty. Nowhere did I expect it. Nowhere did the company promise that they'll do that for me. But, I mean, till my dying day, I'll say that you know, Jet Airways is a great service. Today, the airlines has got into trouble. There are so many issues, so many companies. But I will always say those guys give great service. Those people, the people that really cared about the passengers, comfort and comfort and happiness. I was very happy when this happened. Right? You go forward? Is this I have one more to... uh, yes, yes, sure. So this is meant only for services, is it? Is it equally? Sub call is primarily meant for services, but it's equally applicable to products. For example, you may expect that the refrigerator needs to keep things cool, for example. So products with a service element in it? Not necessarily. The refrigerator keeping things cool is not a service okay. element. It's a product okay, okay. feature. Okay, okay. Not from an after sales service. Not even necessarily. Even not necessarily. Even from a product performance. But yes, it was originally developed Keeping in mind service, which is why it's called serve call. But it applies equally. I mean, wherever there are customer expectations, and that's everywhere. Right? So, yeah. There are a few key sub-concepts when we talk about customer satisfaction studies. We'll talk about a couple of these here. Uh, Dr. Parishraman, who I just mentioned in the context of serve call, also developed something called rate. Okay, I'll just talk about that. 
Any customer satisfaction study typically has two kinds of questions. One is, where do we stand today? And that's evaluative parameters. Are you satisfied? Are you prepared to recommend us? Do you really come back to us if you want to buy? And you know, sometimes, are you prepared to pay a price premium? Are you prepared to buy a further services? Right, but these are the core features. So where do you stand today? in terms of customer satisfaction. This is why do you stand where you stand. But if you are talking about a supermarket for example, was the air conditioning good? Was the range of products wide? Was the stock, you know, was there no absence of expiry stock? Was the display, you know, on the aisles and everything clear? Was the space clear to walk? Was it easy to find what I'm looking for? Could I park my vehicle easily? Is the timing suitable? I want milk in the morning. If the shop opens at 9.30, I'm not too happy about the shop. The politeness of the people, the, the staff there, how long taken in the billing counter. These together will tell me why I am unhappy or unhappy. So these are diagnostic parameters. Right? So any customer satisfaction study needs to have both these sets of questions. Must necessarily have. So these are the core measures. Are you satisfied? Are you prepared to recommend? Do you feel happy enough to come back? And these diagnostic parameters lend themselves, sorry, I'm sorry about this. Yeah. These diagnostic parameters lend themselves to uh, broadly these rated parameters. R stands for reliability. What is reliability? We say without Kohli is a reliable batsman. That means at any point in time, you can count upon him to score runs. So reliability is very similar to consistency. Okay. Assurance. The people that are given the feeling that they know their job, that they're competent, that they're capable, that they're efficient. They give me the assurance that they can do the job. Tangibles. It's a core thing that I'm looking for. You know, the core physical benefits that I'm looking for. Empathy. Does that business understand what I want as a customer? Are able to put themselves in my shoes and relate to what I would be wanting and provide me that. Responsiveness. When I ask a question, how will do the reply? How alert are they? How flexible are they? How responsive are they? So that is the rate. Reliability, assurance, tangibles, empathy, responsiveness. It's a nice little acronym called rate. Again, Dr. Parshiram, it's not mine. I'm borrowing from the so-called model. So the diagnostic parameters in any business will fall into one or the other of this. So every customer satisfaction study needs this evaluative three questions. Uh, it also needs diagnostic questions to tell us why the satisfaction is high or low, as the case might be. Okay, so far. So one more crucial subcontent here, uh, two more. Uh, what is standard deviation? We've all studied standard deviation in various contexts. Variability, consistency, you know, mean, medians, mode, standard deviation. Let's take two situations. You know, both are, let us say, this is a service, automobile service company of, let us say, just for example, let us say this is Maruti. And let us say this is Hyundai. Again, hypothetical examples, mind you. Okay. So, um, on the whole, Maruti's customer satisfaction score is service is 4.0. On the whole, Hyundai is 3.7. So Maruti seems to be better than Hyundai. True, that data is correct. The data is not wrong. What I'm going to say now is not going to contradict the data. This is the service center branch in Bombay. This is the branch in Delhi. This is the branch in Chennai. This is the branch in Kolkata, Bangalore, Hyderabad, so on and so forth. Right? Likewise for Hyundai. Now look at this. The Marathi data goes here and here and here. The Hyundai data is relatively more consistent. It, it still has variation, but not that much of variation. What does it mean? This has better systemic control. This has, it has a better overall performance, but weak systemic control. Some managers are doing a good job. Some managers are doing a bad job. And so the system is not controlling their performance. It's up to the individual manager to do things. Whereas here, all the managers are doing more or less close to the mean, which means the system is controlling what they're doing. Now, 
This means it is easier to improve the score than to improve the score. Let me repeat, I am not saying Hyunta is better than Maruti because of the standard deviation. Maruti score is better, 4.0 is better than 3.7. I am only saying that the standard deviation being lower here in Hyundai, in company B, indicates that it's easier to improve the score here than it is for Maruti. Nothing else. Let's go forward. The third is a, a zone of tolerance which every one of us as human beings can relate to. Let's say we buy, uh, let's say we buy an air conditioner and it's working for a while and then in summer it suddenly conks off. And you know, we have a warranty for repair. We expect the person to come within half a day to repair it. That's expected level of performance. We say at least he has to come the next day. It's a bad minimum. Beyond that, we are like we are fuming because it's summer and they really need air conditioning. Now, if the actual level of performance is is not as per expected, but it is still above the minimum level, then we okay. It is in the zone of tolerance. We can tolerate it. But an actual level of performance is here below the minimum acceptable level then it's even outside the zone of tolerance. We cannot tolerate that level of service. So we want it in half a day. We are ready to wait maximum one day. If it comes after two days, we are like, I made a mistake buying this. I'm going to tell them that they're really terrible. And somebody asked me what I'm going to say, I'm never buy this brand. But if the actual expected is half a day, and then we are ready to wait maximum one day. If it comes within that one day, but not within half a day, then we are like, yeah, but take a fine, they did it. It's all right, it's not too bad. That's a zone of tolerance. Now, every business must measure the zone of tolerance of its customers. Because only then they know how much flexibility they have to perform below the expected level. Are these concepts clear? Is sub call as a concept clear? How, how would they measure that? How would they? They ask people. And you have to read the data intelligently, of course, but you ask people. You need to ask people. Consumers but will often you tell ask, you the truth. If you ask anyone, they would, in this scenario, they would say, I want my air conditioner to be repaired within half a day. You'll be surprised. Consumers will tell you how much they'll tolerate. What you want is expected on a performance. So up to what extent are you prepared to wait? Okay. They will tell you the truth. Consumers normally tell the truth in the survey. Another question is very sensitive, like income or health or something. Consumers normally tell you the truth in the survey. They have no motivation to lie, you see. Are this concept clear? Zone of tolerance. Why is standard deviation important in the context of uh, measuring the table of performance, uh, the rater dimensions, right? And overall sub call model itself. Conceptually clear? We'll go forward. So, customer satisfaction study run by market research company always is quantitative research because you want to measure how satisfied customers are. So, quantitative. Can be face to face, can be telephonic, can be online. Sometimes there is qualitative. We initially understand customer expectations. If you don't know anything about the category, we do some exploratory research and that's qualitative. Sometimes after customers say I'm unhappy, you can go back and talk to them in depth and say, you're unhappy, tell me more details. Did a specific anecdote or an incident happen which makes you so unhappy with me? A little bit of probing can be done qualitatively. But the essential study has to be done quantitatively. Are you clear about why it is quantitative? Also clear about where qualitative can be used, either to explore what customers expect. Either before or after. Or after. After will be to get deeper insight into why or some customers are unhappy. And the typical question I have flowed would be, first we ask, are you happy? Second, this can be second or third, doesn't matter. So this can be second or third, this can be second or third. Will you recommend us, which is advocacy? I'm an advocate for the brand. Will you repurchase or renew your subscription, which is which is loyalty? Are you happy with us on key diagnostic parameters? Are you happy on air conditioning? Are you happy on service, on courtesy, etc., etc.? And open-ended questions. Why are you unhappy? When you uh, have to frame the diagnostic parameters, yeah. do you normally do quantitative uh, research? Not always. So textbook-wise, it is necessary, theoretically, but in practice, the clients that we work with are, are in the business for a fairly long time. 
So they can give us a reasonably good idea of what the expectations are. So we don't need to do it all over again. Right? So customer satisfaction questions tend to be very crisp. Question 1, question 2, question 3. Question 4 will have about 8 or 10 or 12 diagnostic parameters. Question 5 is open and wired and happy. And that's it. It's a crisp question. You, it is not good to mix a whole lot of other questions. There are some clients who come to tell us, oh, the customer is prepared to recommend. Can we take five names from him about whom you would recommend? No. A survey is not a lead generation exercise. It is a survey. We should not go beyond that. Give, give the survey the respect due to it. Can we go forward? So let's look at one particular example. A company provides school supplies. School supplies could be uniforms, geometry boxes, uh, notebooks, laboratory equipment, right, so on and so forth. Uh, so this company provides supplies to schools and they want to measure that their customers are schools. So they want to measure how satisfied their customers are. Small sample size because it's not a big business. Every customer is an important customer. It's not like a refrigerator talking to lakhs of individual customers. It is a, it is a B2B business talking to a few hundred customers. So we did a sample size of 60 people. Done in only one state, Tamil Nadu. 33 people in Chennai, 27 people. ROTN is a general marketing term for rest of Tamil Nadu. So other towns in Tamil Nadu put together is 27. And in this particular situation, it was face-to-face -face study. As already mentioned, it is always quantitative market research for customer satisfaction. Example background is clear. Okay, we'll go forward. This is the question. So you get name of the school, basic details, address, who have been to it as a principal or the correspondent, and you know, we just circle it if it is principal and circle it. I'll stay with this for just a few seconds. Clear? I'll go forward to the next slide. Okay. And can you please tell me what are the products that you buy from? ABC is our client, the company that supplies the material. So they buy brown sheets, uh, Duplo ink and master, I don't know what that is. DVD writers, interactive whiteboards, lab equipment, notebooks, socks, software, uh, t-shirts, uniforms, etc. Which are the products you buy from this product? So our company, our client provides all these products. Right? Just go through it for a second and I'll move forward. Alright, sure. Now, we, we are in the main question. Please look at this card and tell me which statement best describes how satisfied you are. Okay? To go back to our scaling, this is a variable disposition scale. This is a seven point scale. This is a balanced scale because it has three negatives and three positives and one midpoint. Right? It's a seven point scale. So, totally dissatisfied, substantially dissatisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, neutral. Somewhat satisfied, substantially satisfied, totally satisfied. Right? Clear? We go forward. This is a five point variable, sorry. This is a five point variable distribution scale. Again, balanced with a midpoint. Right? Which statement best describes your intention to continue buying from our client? This is loyalty. Definitely not like, probably not like, probably like, definitely like. Right? Simple, right? Pretty simple, straightforward skills. We've seen this kind of skills before. This is advocacy. Which statements describes your likelihood of recommending? Okay. I would never recommend, probably not recommend, probably recommend, definitely recommend. Okay. Now, there are many research companies that use a variation of the scale. They don't use this scale. They use a 0 to 10 scale. Where 10 is definitely recommend, 0 is definitely not recommend. And that is called the NPS scale. Okay, the way you analyze it, NPS scale stands for Net Promoter 
keeps cool. So here the consumer becomes a promoter. The consumer goes and tells other people, buy this, I recommend it. Okay. So this gives a lot of weightage to people who give 9 or 10 on the, 10, on the 0 to 10 scale. It says people who give 1 or 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 are all negative. People who give 9 or 10 are positive and people who give 7 or 8 are neutral. So percentage of 9 plus percentage of 10 minus percentage of 1 to 6 is the net promoter score. Right, so if, just to give an example, if 0 is given by 5, if 1 is given by 2, 2 is given by 3 people, 3 is given by 2 people, 4 is given by 5 people, 5 is given by 6 people, 6 is given by 3 people. So this is 5 plus 2, 7 plus 3, 10, 12, 17, 23, 26, right, 7, 10, 12, 17, 23, 26. Let's say 7 is given by 22 people, 8 is given by 19 people, 9 is given by 15 people, and 10 is given by 18 people. So 15 plus 18 is 33. This is 41. 33 plus 41 is 100. So your NPS is equal to this 33 minus this 26 equal to plus 7. All right, so this is a measure which you need to be familiar with, NPS. Go to the Google, there's enough material on NPS, which is a very commonly used measure. So, which is why I'm going through this value quickly. It's a very common measure, that, but it's something you definitely need to be familiar with. Shall we go forward? In, in this questionnaire, yes. the first question had seven points. Are you satisfied? Points. Seven points, yeah. The Next question five. had five. Yeah. And the third question had five. Yes, scales, yes. Seven five points scales. points in this Yes, case. yes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. There's no rule that all the questions should have the same number of scale points. Not at all. For every question, we have to think about what's a suitable scale. That's the way to go. Was that a question? But I anticipated the question correctly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Would people be able to differentiate uh, when you are asking. Any market research study, you have to ensure that the respondent is properly engaged with the process of answering the questions. If they are answering in a half-hearted fashion, even if you make the questionnaire extremely simple, they won't answer correctly. Okay. That is a challenge by itself and that's a necessity. I will go forward. Yes. Then I said, you know, we have questions about individual parameters. So in this case, the individual parameters are, are you satisfied with the quality of interaction with the company? With the commercial terms like billing and prices, after sale service. So I satisfied with overall quality of interaction, one to seven. So we ask a series of, you know, are you satisfied with this? Are you satisfied with this? Are you satisfied with this? Give us a score out of one to seven, right? So I said, read out some parameters. Please tell me how satisfied you are. Clear? This is those like those later individual dimension. In the shop case, it was quality of AC space in the aisle, ease of finding the correct category, etc, etc. And, you know, a few more parameters we have here. How satisfied are you with the product quality? How satisfied are you with the delivery times? Right? How satisfied are you with the price? How satisfied are you with the company involvement in terms of service? So, each of these things, product quality, delivery times, price, level of involvement, total dissatisfied, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The questions are the same. We just have 7 or 8 diagnostic parameters, service quality, commercial terms, etc, etc, etc. Are you happy on each of these individual things? These are the things that the school is looking for. These are the dimensions. Yeah. Yes, sure. Slide. Yes, sure. This. So, which is diagnosis? This is also diagnostic. This is diagnostics. Okay. And so are these. Right? Okay. They're all diagnostics. Okay. This is diagnostic. This is diagnostic. Oh. Right? 
Why are they in this format? The client wanted in this format, that's all. But they don't take those two parameters. You could have asked them in one big table also. Okay. Like earlier, we had just those three in one table, right? You could have asked all seven in one table. That's fine. But this is for each product that the client wants. Yes. Right. And respectively. Thing, respectively. Earlier, is earlier is for the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So respectively, which your products they buy. So that's all. I so I told you the question is crisp. Mm -hmm. We are done with the question. Mm -hmm. Were you happy? Will you come back to us? Will you recommend? Are you happy in individual parameters? And there's an open ended question which I have not shown you. That's it. We are done. What which is the open ended question? Uh, if you're not happy, why are you not happy? Okay. All right. Okay. Now um, I'm going to talk about how the analysis comes. Please ignore this. This is not in the scope of this particular uh, session here. So, please ignore this. Well, it, it, there's nothing very really complex about it. We use something called a C metric index. We create an index which is a combination of three questions. That's all it is. It's, it's not that it's very complex, complicated or confidential or anything like that. Just to understand the distraction. Oh. Right? So, anyway, so since it is here on the slide, it's a composite of the responses to three questions. Okay. And we give a score from 0 to 100 so that it's easy to analyze. So three questions are, three questions are, are you satisfied? Will you, you know, buy from this method again? And would you recommend? Sorry. So the three questions together go into one composite index which we call symmetric, that's all. It's an easy way to compare, give one number for the companies as a whole. So let's look at what the results are for this particular project that we have done, assignment. For example, says for 60 if you remember. Mm -hmm. Right? So the C matrix score, as I told you, we are given out of 100. So 69 out of 100, which is okay, which is not too good. Out of that, you know, uh, 26 plus 14, 40% 40 of our sample has a score of more than 80, which is really very good. Okay, we'll go forward. Look at satisfaction. We had a seven point scale. Thirty seven percent of the respondents are totally satisfied. Seven percent are totally dissatisfied. Substantially and totally together is sixty four percent, which is pretty good. So nearly two thirds of the sample. Sorry, it's fifty nine percent. I'm sorry, it's twenty two. So 59% is either substantially or totally satisfied, which is not really very good, which is less than 60%. And as many as 7 plus 2 plus 9, 19% is dissatisfied. That's not a good sign. Right? 19% of the customers being dissatisfied is not a very good indication uh, for the company. There's something here called mean score. We have taken these percentages and calculated something called the mean score. The maximum score is 7, right? The minimum is it's on a score of 1 is a minimum, 7 is a maximum, and this particular company is at 5.4. I mean, uh, we will, um, I just quickly explain how the mean score Yes. Uh, you were, you have only highlighted the 37 plus 22, which is totally satisfied and substantially satisfied. Yes. Even 20 percent is saying somewhat, which means the 37 plus 22 plus 20 are satisfied. Right? Somewhat That's satisfied right? is just a polite way of saying, yeah, I am okay, thanks. It's not really a good. Uh, so wouldn't that. We wouldn't consider that as a positive feedback. It's more of a neutral feedback. Okay. Um, in case you're not clear about how to do this mean score calculation, I'll just explain it very quickly. We will be covering it later when we do uh, data analysis. 37 into 7 plus 22 into 6 plus 20 into 5 and so on up to 7 into 1. Right? 37, 7, 37 to 2, 10, 7, 7 to 49, 2, 59, 22, 6, 1, 22, 20, 100. This is Two fours are eight, ten threes are thirty, two twos are four. 
So what is this? 2 59 plus 132 is uh, 391, 491, 499, 539, and 33. So the mean score is equal to 540 divided by 100 because the total of this is 100%. Right? The total of this is 100%. So divided by 100, it's 540. Four. Simple weighted mean. There's no simple mathematics. Okay. We'll go forward? Yes. So satisfaction is not too good. It's okay. It's okay, okay. Um, loyalty, again, okay, okay. Not too good. At what point would you, would you consider? Well, it to be generally, if it is more than 4.2, we'll consider it to be very good. All right. Those are benchmarks for the industries works with. Intention to recommend advocacy, not good. 3.6, it's less than even 3.8, so it's not good at all. And 16% says definitely not, which is not a good sign at all. All right. And then we can do this by, we said we did a sample in Chennai, 33 people, and we had a sample of 27 outside Chennai. So the, does the score vary? No, it's the same across. It doesn't vary by whether the customer is in Chennai or somewhere else. We can analyze it by different, you know, different job reviews or whether the customer has been in business for five years or ten years. We can analyze it by all those things. Uh, and then we said, they, we asked them what are they buying. So among people are buying brown sheets, which is only five people. So let's look at this. 48 people out of the sample of 60 people are buying notebooks. And for them, the satisfaction score is 68. The people are buying DVD writer is very happy, or the brown sheets is very happy. There's only 45 people here, only one person here. So the real chunk is here, and they're only averagely happy. Right? So the score, the symmetric, since we've got one index kind of thing, we can break it up gives us the flexibility to compare across different kinds of products and uh, geographies and so forth. And we, we talked about individual product dimensions. So how happy are they with the product quality for brown sheets? That's good. It's all five, four point eight. How happy are they with the notebooks? It's reasonably good, right? But it's not good. It's one to seven is a scale survey. So it's not very good. Right, and this is a real problem. 4.4 is a real problem on a 1 to 7 scale. So they're really unhappy with the delivery times of notebooks. So that's a key area that the company has to look at. Uh, six customers are buying uniforms. They're really unhappy with the delivery times of the uniforms. I mean, the child is, maybe the school has started and the child doesn't have uniforms. Right? So that really is, uh, that's how we analyze this data. So these, these scores tell us where to focus where the problem areas are. Are we clear on this? Would you be doing yes. any correlation analysis? On well, we can. Or? We can. We can. We can. It will give us some added insight. Yeah. But on a base of 60, uh, these numbers speak for themselves. We, we can clearly identify, you know, um, that this is a priority area. Right? I mean, this entire thing is a priority area. It's very clear. This data is speaking for itself. Mm. It's telling us what the priorities are. So what do we conclude from the study? On the whole, this course is disappointing. It has failed to measure up to the expectations created, especially on the dimension of timely delivery. There is a positive standing. However, that they are still ready to purchase again, by and large. So the business relationship is intact, provided they fix it. Right? Is it okay? So what? Company must pay special attention to the supply of uniforms. This is the overall take out from this exercise. I'll go back one thing here. In the previous example that we used of brand health, we saw a lot of percentages here. And here we're seeing a lot of mean scores. Again, this is something we learned in each standard mathematics. We've still not used powerful techniques, but we've still got a very, very actionable story. Right? 
Are we clear about how customer satisfaction studies work in practice? Yes. Can we close this here? Yes.